Good morning and welcome. I'm so glad you're joining us today to worship our Lord Jesus. Traditionally in the church, it's Pentecost. Pentecost is the day that we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit after Jesus ascended back into heaven. The Holy Spirit was sent, as Jesus tells us, to remind us of everything he taught. We also learn from other parts of Scripture that it's the work of the Holy Spirit to create faith in us and to sustain that faith. And although it's Pentecost, we're going to continue with our study of the book of James, knowing that there is nothing that we can do. There's nothing that we can do those things that James speaks of in his letter unless the Holy Spirit is working in our lives. Pastor Mike will be talking about that in just a few minutes, how faith and action must work together. One last thing, we continue to prepare for having live worship services once again here at CTK. Be sure to sign up for the e-news so you know when that day is going to happen and register your attendance with us today. With that, please join your hearts and minds with me as we worship our Lord Jesus. If you've been walking the same road for miles and miles, if you've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies, if you've been trying to fill the same old holes inside, there's a better life, there's a better life. We make our beginning in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. Heavenly Father, as we come into this place of worship, we cannot help but think of your amazing love. I mean, Lord, we've sinned against you in our thinking and doing. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not been loving, kind, and gentle with other people. Lord, we hold grudges. We play favorites. And we fail to forgive others for the sake of your son, Jesus, and his innocent, bitter suffering and death. We pray that you would forgive us and renew us by your Holy Spirit, that we would live lives that are pleasing to you. Amen. My friends, I have great news for you. Almighty God in his mercy has sent his son, Jesus, to give his life for you, to suffer, to die on a cross, to forgive you of all your sins. Be assured, you are forgiven of all your sin. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Greetings, everyone. The uh, text for the message this morning as we continue our study of James is from James chapter 2, beginning at verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith, but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called. God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. This is our text. Our Lord's grace and his mercy and his peace and his constant love and joy be yours through our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen. Dear family, anybody want a virus? What do you, um, come on, there's got to be some takers out there for a virus. I mean, it's free. You, you can have this virus for nothing. Well, of course not. No, nobody wants the virus. Look at, look at what's happened and how it's, it's wrecked not only our, our society and our economy, but, but people's lives. The, the, the virus has been just crazy, hasn't it? We don't want a virus. In fact, let me give you a couple of definitions of a virus. An infectious agent that replicates only within the cells of living hosts. A corrupting influence on morals or the intellect. Oh, and here's one. A microscopic parasite that can infect living organisms and cause disease. Well, of course, that's what's been happening with this COVID-19 virus. We don't like it. We don't want it. But we have it. And when it infects somebody's body, that's when your immune system kicks in and, and does everything that it can do to deal with the virus. So the virus is on offense our immune system, in that sense, is on defense, trying to fight it off. And, and it's that kind of picture of this virus that makes me think of sin as a virus. Because sin infects us from the moment of conception. We don't have a choice. It's there. And it affects the way that we think and the way that we speak and the actions that we take. And it, it cuts us off from God. I mean, Because of sin, the only thing that we deserve from God is eternal damnation. I don't want that. But I can't pay the price that God demands for my sin. That price is my life. But if I were to give my life, I'd be dead and I couldn't claim the benefits. I couldn't win the victory over sin, death, and Satan and claim those benefits and blessings that come from it. And, and God didn't have to do anything either. So in a sense, we're kind of stuck. Except, and this is huge, God loves us so much. I mean, it's beyond what you and I can imagine or dream possible. Because of that passionate, intense love for you and I, he devised a plan, put it into to action, and it was a plan that was going to overcome every obstacle Every circumstance, nothing was going to stand in the way from him coming to rescue us 
from that virus of sin by becoming our sacrifice on the cross. We should have been on the cross, yet he went there for us. He didn't deserve it because he was perfect, but he allowed himself to be put on the cross in our place to be our sacrifice and to shed blood for us. So there was blood flowing down the cross from Jesus because he was there for us. And he paid the price with his life. And it killed him, folks. He wasn't in some coma. He was dead. They carried him off. They buried him in the tomb. But he rose from the dead in victory over sin, death, and Satan. And and gives us those blessings. Those blessings by faith. It's the Holy Spirit who works faith in our hearts. And gives us those blessings. And when we get to this this book in James and this chapter, this chapter two, James is talking to us about that faith that we have in our hearts from the Holy Spirit and what that faith needs to look like. In fact, let me read just a short section of that scripture reading from a different translation. It reads like this. Brothers and sisters, It doesn't make any sense to say you have faith and act in a way that denies that faith. Mere talk never gets you very far, and a commitment to Jesus only in words will not save you. It would be like seeing a brother or sister without any clothes out in the cold and begging for food and saying, Shalom, friend, you should get inside where it's warm and eat something, but do nothing about his needs leaving him cold and alone on the street. What good would your words alone do? The same is true with faith. Without actions, faith is useless. Boy, that that really says it all, doesn't it? In fact, I've I've got a couple points I want to give you after that reading. And that first point is simply this, as... As folks who believe in Jesus as their Savior, we need a changed attitude that results in a growing passion for Jesus and others. You know, in that that James passage, in that whole passage, it it also talked about the fact that we can't just have an intellectual assent of Jesus. In other words, we can't just go around saying, well, I believe in Jesus. I believe he went to the cross. I, I believe Jesus is the son of God. And that's it. It's just an intellectual sin because it says the demons even believe that. The demons know and they believe that Jesus was the Messiah and that Jesus is God. And, and James said, instead, we need a biblical faith that grasps onto Jesus and responds out of joy and gratitude for what the Lord has done for us so that that faith in Jesus begins to shape and define who we are. And it affects the thoughts that we have, the words that we speak, and the actions that we take as we want to do more and more things that are more Christ-like in our lives every day. James says we need that kind of a faith that is coupled with action. We don't want a faith that just, it keeps you on the sidelines. He would say, that's not even faith if you're just sitting on the sidelines. With with that growing attitude and that growing passion in Jesus, resulting from what he's done for us, it's a faith that wants to, to, to leap and to run and to get out there and to get involved and to get in people's lives and to do all that we can to bring the love of Jesus to them. It's like we're just itching to get going and to do all that we can for other people because of the way Jesus has affected us. And that leads us to this next point. And that simply is, that we need to lead what I'm calling, and bear with me on this, a fruity life. We need to lead a fruity life. You see, the result of of, of believing in Jesus as our Savior is we, we will automatically do good works. And and the more as that passion grows, it's going to release creativity as we continue to think about how can we love and serve other people. Um, you know, in, in, in the church here on this Sunday, we celebrate what's called Pentecost. 
That's the day when um, the Jews were gathered together in Jerusalem for one of the three festivals where they were all supposed to be present in Jerusalem. And the Holy Spirit came on the disciples that day and, and came on them in a supernatural way. And when they talk about tongues of fire that were on them. And the Holy Spirit gave them the ability to speak in different languages that they did not know, but other people around them could understand because they were from other regions of the country. So in effect, everybody could hear the good news about Jesus in their own native tongue, in their own language. It's that same power that the Holy Spirit had with those disciples that the Holy Spirit gives to each and every one of us as he works through us to produce what we're calling, and it's from Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. What is that fruit of the Spirit? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Who needs you to produce that kind of fruit in their lives? In fact, let me ask you this next question. How is your fruit production coming? How's it going? What's happening? I mean, speaking of production, it makes me think, you know, during this time of the year in, in, a, in a large part of our nation, Crops are, are either have been planted or in the, they're in the process of finishing the planting. And then they're going to move into that season where the crops are growing. And, and you want conditions to be just right because you want production to be the best that it can be. But when the heat is on and there's a lack of water, it, it really negates a lot of production and drives it down. And it just makes me think in our culture, the heat is on. The heat is on with this virus that we have and how angry and upset and, and, and how divisive it is for people. We're in an election year. And, and yes, it is, a, it is a very dividing time in our country. People have definite, strong, different opinions, and it causes a lot of things to happen. Uh, so the heat is on and it does become very draining. Well, how can we have fruit production, that fruit of the Spirit, when the heat is on, when our temptation is to get angry, and when it's very draining, how can we produce fruit? We need to take in water, but not tap water, the living water of Jesus Christ. Because you know, when you think about it, sometimes it's easy to produce this kind of fruit that we talked about with the people that you love, the people that are like you, the people that don't challenge you, the people that just support and encourage you. But what about folks that don't? What about folks that think differently or act differently? How can we produce fruit in their lives? Well, when the heat is on, it's by taking in the living water of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. It, it reminds me of a passage that I love in First Peter. In 1 Peter 4, Peter is talking about some things that he said need to happen. But he then says, above all else. So I, it's like, I know these things are important that I just talked about, Peter would say. But above all else, he says, love each other earnestly. And it's that word earnestly that captures my attention, not only in this patch as it talks about love, but when we talk about the fruit of the Spirit, and when we talk about passion, how can we do all of those things earnestly? You see, in the original, this word earnestly is a compound word, and what it means is to stretch out, a big stretch, meaning when the heat is on and when things are draining, the Lord wants us to take in the living water of Jesus so that we can produce fruit, even though it stretches us. And it takes us like to our boundaries because we might be dealing with people who are different from us and think different from us. People who might get angry, but, it, but it's people who need to be loved and served and encouraged. A big stretch to stretch out, to love each other earnestly. Well, folks, I, I know we've talked about a lot so far, 
But I want to give you three takeaways so that you don't forget um, about what we've talked about. Three simple takeaways that I have for you today. The first takeaway is simply this. Pray for the Spirit to grow your attitude and passion and help you see the value of loving and serving others. You see, as our our attitude grows and becomes more Christ-like, as our passion grows for our Lord and Savior Jesus, creativity will kick in. And, and it'll help us see the value of serving and loving others. And all of a sudden, we'll be brainstorming about ways that we can help others. Yes, it might just be an encouraging word. It might be sending a card or a note or a phone call or a text message or whatever it is. But we can be creative in those words that we speak and, and really in, encourage and support people. Or it could be in different ways. Maybe somebody needs a meal or some food or some some help with resources or whatever it is. But it's the value of loving and serving others. And we ask the Lord to grow that in our lives. Who needs you to take action in their lives? Pray about that. The second takeaway. Be intentional about taking time to listen and understand others. Be intentional. You see, folks, um, our schedules tend to run our lives. We got places to go and things to do and people to see and whom we miss people. And we're so focused on what we have to do in our schedules. Everything else is a blur. I mean, I remember talking to a congregational president once and, and I gave him the challenge of taking time each day for at least 14 days and I've even lengthened that to a 21-day challenge for some people, of just taking time to recognize how the Lord is working in your life to help you be the hands and feet of Jesus. And he said, he said, Mike, I, after going through that, I actually noticed my neighbors. He said, I've lived in this area for 10 years in this neighborhood. And I really didn't notice my neighbors because when I would come home, as soon as I would drive in the, in the driveway, I'd click the clicker, get in the garage, click it again so the garage door would close because I got things to do. I, I had to keep moving. And, and he said, all of a sudden, I was forced because I took the challenge to just stop a minute and notice my neighbors instead of closing the garage door. And I actually had conversations with people. You and I think that's simple, but... When your schedule runs your life, it's kind of hard. We want to be intentional about taking that time to listen and to understand others. And then our third takeaway, ramp up your fruit production as a hands and feet of Jesus. Not because you're trying to check off a list. Oh, I did this or I helped there. Or, you know, you go down the list checking it off. And not because you want to try to get on God's good side. But as a reaction to what God has done for us out of joy, out of love, out of thanksgiving, out of gratitude. We're just bubbling over. And we want to do all that we can to love and serve people as the hands and feet of Jesus. In fact, um, folks, I got, I, I got to, in closing, I, I got to tell you a true story. It happened about 10 days ago. Story about uh, a family, husband and wife, trying to raise five kids. So they have five children at home. And um, resources were limited. Um, The wife was um, in food service. She had been a manager in food service for five years. And the virus hits. So resources become even more limited in their life. And now as they're they're trying to reopen um, with the food service, it's it's not reopened 100%, obviously. So resources are still limited. And she was working with schedules and people's lives and excuses. And this happened and that happened. So she's getting frustrated and upset. And and it's just not going well at all. Well, after going through one of those days, she left and she went to the store because she had to pick some things up. Let me read you her exact words from her letter. I was so distracted that when I returned home from the store, I had realized that I forgot one of the items I went out for, baby formula. Then I frantically handed my 20-year-old son $40 
and asked him to run back up and grab it for me. Now, I remember this is after she'd been through this terrible day. She'd gone to the store. And in fact, in the middle of the store, I, I remember the, the story. It said she was just standing in the middle of the store going, so God, where are you? Are you here? What, what's happening? Haven't you ever done that in your life at a frustrating time and you pray and you wonder if God's answering prayer? You go, God, where are you? That happened to her. She forgot the formula. She went home, handed the 20-year-old son the $40. When my son returned home, he looked at me with a quizzical expression. I asked him what was the matter, and he handed me the formula and the $40 back. When I looked at him with a confused look, he said, I don't know, Mom. Some random woman walked up to me when I was about to check out. She said that God told her to pay for that formula, and she insisted, and she paid for it. Where was God? Was God there? Yes. And that woman who, who took action was being intentional and doing all that she could to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And when she believed that God was telling her to pay for that formula, she ramped up her fruit production and she stepped in and paid for that formula. Wow. So we need to pray about, right? Who needs our fruit production? Who needs us to be the hands and feet of Jesus in their lives? That's something to pray about and to watch for, especially in this week. Pray about this every day and then open your eyes because God's going to bring people into your life who you can be the hands and feet of Jesus to who you can produce fruit in their lives. So I pray that the Spirit will continue to grow our attitude, our passion, and our fruit production as we seek to love others earnestly. In Jesus' name, amen. Folks, at this time, we are going to continue with our prayers. We want to bring those prayers before the Lord and talk to him. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for being with us and for watching over us and for helping us to, to delve into James chapter 2 and really, really discover some things there about faith and action and how they are not separate, but they're really one. Um, be with us, Lord, and, and, and help us. We don't want to sit on the sidelines. We want to be participants. We want to just leap into action and to do all that we can to produce the fruit of the Spirit in people's lives. Be with us, watch over us, and help us, Lord, as we do that. And, and part of that, Lord, is we want to pray for others as well. We pray for those that don't know Jesus. We pray, Lord, that they would know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We pray that you are with them, that you watch over them, and that the Holy Spirit would bring people to faith, as well as strengthen people's faith in him. We pray for those, Lord, that are, are continuing to help others during this um, virus situation. So we do think of our first responders. We think of our, our, our food banks and charities as well that are trying to do all that they can to produce um, resources and to give those resources in, into people's lives that are uh, in such need. Uh, continue to bless those efforts and to be with those folks. Lord, we also pray for specific people during this time as well. We think of Maureen and Ann, Barb, Suzanne, and Steve Dregemeyer, for the Figueroa family, for Pam and Helen and Herb, for Alice and Sally, for the Oliveras family, for Kay and for Marlene. We just commit these people to you, Lord, and ask that you are with them. We ask that you provide healing in their life, whether that is physical healing, or whether that is emotional healing, or whatever the need is, Lord, we, we just pray that you are with them and watch over them. We know, Lord, we're, we're also maybe thinking about some specific people in our lives, family, friends, and others, and we include those in, in prayer, Lord, and, and want to do all that we can, Lord, to help them, but ask you to bless them 
and to watch over them, Lord. So please be with us, Lord, and continue to increase our passion for you, unlock creativity in our lives, and help us to ramp up our fruit production as we give all glory and thanks to you. Father, we bring all of this to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now receive the benediction of our Lord, which is directly from Scripture, directly from Numbers chapter 6, where it says, The Eternal One, bless and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Eternal lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. What a friend we have in Jesus is to bless my sins are gone. I see grace on every horizon and forever and ever his heart is my home. Everybody has trials and temptations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Everybody knows heartbreak and isolation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But we can lay our burdens down. Oh, lay our burdens down. What a friend we have in Jesus. East to west, my sins are gone. I'll see grace on every horizon. And forever and ever, his heart is my home.